assignment I put out there, um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit, and we're also going to talk about it in lab, because if you completed that assignment, um, whichever the assignment was due right at the break or before the break, right around there, your, your job is, your, your next task is to refactor it. And what I mean by refactor it, um, it's just another fancy way of saying improving it without changing the functionality. So, you know, I hesitate to use the word enhance because usually when you talk about enhancing an application, you're talking about putting some new functionality into it. With refactoring, um, refactoring means taking code and, and uh, changing it so the code is better. It doesn't necessarily do anything new, but what it does, it does better. Now, what makes for better code? What, if you had two pieces of code, both did the same thing, how, on what basis would you say one piece of code was better than the other? Yes. Readability um, is one thing. And readability, really, because that translates into maintainability. Right? Readability uh, in itself is, is, is good. But really, the, the big win of readability is that it, it makes the code more maintainable. All right? Um, so little things like indenting and all those things that, that I harp over um, are important because it makes it more readable. You know, meaningful variable names, uh, that sort of thing. All those things can make it more readable, including comments in your code. And the real win is that it becomes more maintainable. What's another thing that would, would elevate a program or, or a piece of code from being okay to being really good? Reusable, all right. Reusable is a sort of, in, in a way, it's a cousin of, of maintainability, right? Because if you can reuse a piece of code, that means that you don't have to write something similar the next time you want to do something similar, all right, if that makes sense. Um, in other words, if you have code that you can reuse, that you, you have a real component that you can plug in, and use, then again, it's, you don't have to go and, and make changes or make new classes or whatever it is you have to do. So reusability is very closely related to maintainability. Any other thoughts about what makes code better or worse? Yeah, one, one consideration, and I will say this is not probably at the, 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 how do I want to say, this is not probably as important as it was at some point in the past, but for some code it's still important, and it'll always be a consideration, is the efficiency of the code, the speed of the code. All right? Um, in my mind, though, that, that, that can be trumped by maintainability. You know, I will tell students, you know, um, to write two if statements instead of an if and an else. All right? Uh, or uh, a, a compound if with multiple conditions. Uh, one might be slightly more uh, efficient, but probably a little more maintainable is worth it. But yeah, you, you want to avoid, and again, for certain, for certain kinds of code, uh, the, the efficiency and the speed of it would be more important than others. Any other things that you can think of? We can add to this list of things that would make, take programs that were okay or adequate or however you want to put it and elevate them to being really good. Okay, um, in, in a way, yeah, uh, I, I'm trying to think that is a little different than reusability. You said take advantage and use classes that uh, are, are in the framework. In other words, don't reinvent the wheel. If there's a class that already does something, um, it's probably better to use it as opposed to, to, uh, to writing, crafting your own uh, um, um, solution. You know, you could probably come up with something that acted like an array list, but, well, you know, why bother? You know, there already is a perfectly good array list out there, all right? The last thing I would add to those lists, and everything you said is true, and the last thing I would add to that list is um, fault tolerance. What happens when something goes wrong, all right? Um, there, you know, uh, the, the complexity of software comes into the fact that, you know, so many things are going on and there's so many instructions and there's so many
conditions that could be met, um, that could occur, uh, that could potentially trigger errors. And really, if, if an application blows up, that's bad. If it handles the air gracefully, then that's better. What do I mean by handling the air gracefully? I mean typically informing the user, and again, the user could be someone interacting with it uh, you know, on a keyboard and screen, or it could be um, you know, some sort of process that runs where you're logging entries to a log file, you know, more of a batch type process. But informing someone that something went, uh, went wrong and give a sense of what, they, what can be done to correct it. All right. We're going to talk about uh, a couple things today that will help with maintainability uh, of your code and will help with definitely the fault tolerance uh, today. And these should be two big considerations um, when you go to refactor your code. What I want to do is for the, for the folks that have finished that assignment, I want to take maybe five minutes with each of you in lab to talk about the assignment and to, to point some things out. So, um, you know. We'll run through it. We'll do a little mini code review of it where we look at the lines of code and we discuss it. And we talk about maybe what you could do different or what you're doing great in it or, or whatever. So that should be a consideration in your refactoring, any advice that, that, uh, that uh, we, we talk about. The other factor should be the stuff that we're going to learn this week. And that is uh, static variables and final variables and try catches or error checking. All right, let's talk about static uh, variables first. Um, a static variable is, is an attribute that's related to a class but does not depend on a specific member of the class. All right? Uh, an example of that, you know. Um, the, ra uh, the ratio of a circle's diameter to its circumference or circumference to its dynamic, uh, diameter, also known as pi, all right? Pi is an attribute associated with circle, all right? But it doesn't vary from circle to circle. That is, every circle, if you take its circumference and divide by the diameter, you get pi, all right? So that would be a good candidate for a static, um, a static variable, right? Because it's not like this circle has a value of 3 for pi, and that circle has a value of 4 for pi, and so on down the line. Thinking of your homework assignment, your most recent homework assignment, what could be candidates, good candidates for static variables in that assignment? That was the schedule and tuition calculation. What could be an example of a static variable in, in that situation? The fee, right, right, the, 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 uh, actually sort of probably all the fees, right? In other words, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't exactly remember the rules of it, but there were fees based on whether it was a lab class or a, a, um, uh, a lecture class. There was a, uh, a fee for in-county or in-state and out-of-state students. So any of those could probably be static because it's not like different in-state students get a different tuition rate. All right. Um, the uh, in-state in students get one rate. The out-of-state students get some other rate. All right. So that is an attribute of that kind of student, but it doesn't vary from student to student to student. Um, likewise, the, the, the lab fee for a lab class. A lab class, well, the lab fee doesn't depend on which lab class you're talking about. It's a certain rate for, for each lab class. So that's an example of a, a static variable. Um, closely associated with static variables, in fact, often they go together to form uh, the equivalent of, in, in what other, in other languages might be called constants, um, is the notion of a variable that is final. All right, a, a variable that is final cannot have its value changed. All right cannot have its value changed. It either is set up as part of its declaration 
or it's set in the constructor. Has to be set one of those two places. For example, I'm going to go into the circle and I'm going to say private static final double pi equals 3.14159. Does anyone know um, more digits of pi than that? I, I actually on, on 314, you know, pi day last week, I, I saw a cartoon that said that and it's like, um, I, I think this this many digits was still in the acceptable range, and if you knew more than that, they they kind of said that you know you should get out more and and have some fun and and breathe some fresh air and do that sort of thing. All right, so static means again that it cannot. Uh, or I'm sorry, static means that it doesn't vary from circle to circle. All right. Um, final means it cannot be changed. So I would have to either set it here, or Set it, set it in the constructor. Whenever that is, yeah, whenever it's initialized, it, 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 I could not have a method later on that said set pi, that took an argument and set the value of pi. Right. Usually for constants, you might as well just put them up here. Now, I'm going to write a I'm going to write a um, constructor for this that sets the radius. So radius equals arg. And then I'm going to write a get function to get pi. Now, typically what I do with um, constants like this and the thing that I've seen done often is you don't really treat them like normal getters and setters. You don't say like get pi and obviously you don't say set pi because you're not allowed. You might do something like this, public double pi and that simply will return the value of pi. That way you can almost use it as though it's a variable when you go to use it. So let's go in and um, let's see, I have these two things. I'm going to make my test class have some very simple code that simply says system.out.println circle dot pi. Um, let's go and compile this. Ah, I have to make that a static method too. Static method is just like a static 
variable insofar as it does the method does not depend on the individual. It's not like there's a copy of the method for each individual object. I can throw on a final on there, which means that that, um, that, that method could not be overridden by any ancestor of circle. So can't really think of what, what a good subclass of circle would be. Uh, but you can override it in there by declaring it final. All right. So now I go Java test and I can see the value for pi. Now I will say this. This is why I almost feel like turning the microphone off so I'm not committed to saying that, you know, I, I, I can deny ever saying it if, if, if you know, I'm um, brought before the programming court. It's probably not horrible to make these kind of variables that are constant public variables, right? Because you can't change them, can't do anything with them, and it can improve maybe a little bit the readability of the code. So if you do this public static final double pi, you could then go and say print out circle dot pi and it gives you the result. I'm not even sure if too many purists would really have an issue with that. Because you're definitely still following the spirit of data hiding and, and all that. All right. It, so I guess I really wouldn't care either way if you did it, as long as you uh, made it a, a static final. Now. Notice what I did uh, uh, typically, and again, typically I've seen this done, is you somehow name it slightly different. You know, sometimes I've seen put people put like an underscore in front of it. I made it all capitals. That's sort of the convention that I've followed in the past, is that you make these variable names all capitals. Um, and likewise, I made the method associated with it all capitals as well. That's more of my convention, uh, you know. I, it just helps, it sort of helps you see that that's not an instance, that, that, that you're using that like a constant. All right, questions on that. So when we say static, again, we mean that it doesn't relate to the instance. There's just one defined for the class. It, it, uh, another way to say it is it doesn't require an instance of the class to run. We've been using static functions since day one in this class. Namely, oops, system.out.println. All right. We did not make a system object. That's the system class, and we're calling a method on that. So that's a static function. Uh, static method. A static method, therefore, doesn't require having an instance of the class. You can you can call it. All right. Um, final. You can make variables final, and again, that means that it has to be uh, initialized either uh, as part of the declaration of the variable or in the constructor. You can make methods final, which means that no subclass can override them. All right. And lastly, you can make classes final, which means that no ancestors of those classes are allowed. All right. So, for example, if I were to make public final, class circle I couldn't say like well let's make a nice circle class or big circle class or, or whatever that
we couldn't say that this class extends circle if I made the circle class final. So final is a way to put the end of the inheritance chain, so you can't inherit. And then I couldn't do something like this with a subclass of circle. Likewise, I couldn't override pi to return something else. Let's see. Well, let's go and compile that one then. Java C nice circle that Java. And it compl uh, complains two ways. First of all, it can inherit from circle because it's final. And I cannot extend or override the pi function because um, that method is declared as being final. So, it's a little bit of, I don't know what you'd call it, safety or security that you can build in to your code that, that future generations of programmers can't come and mess it up. Well, I don't know if you can ever guarantee that, right? You have to make them work harder to mess it up then. So, for example, you could not, if I make circle final, I could not have someone mess up my value for pi by creating a subclass of circle that had a different value for pi. All right? Because I've declared it final and I declared the method final. All right. So that's static and final. And, and I think you could probably see, and, and we mentioned a few of the ways that um, you, could, you could do that in, in your assignment. Now, let me make sure that this still compiles and then we'll move on. All right. Okay, so now we're going to get into error catching. All right. And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, make some errors and, and then, then catch them. And we'll probably, we'll talk about this today and we'll probably talk about this um, um, going forward as well. How many of you are familiar with the try-catch blocks, either from Visual Basic or from other programming languages? Okay. Uh, I see most of you are, but, but so, some of you didn't seem to raise your hand, so let, let's go over them. The notion of a try-catch block is that we can put a try-catch block around code that we are suspicious of. What do I mean by code that we're suspicious of? Code that has a chance of failing and failing badly. For example, let's say we are going to accept input from the user and divide two numbers by one number by another number. Well, if you divide by zero, you're going to have a problem, right? So, of course we could put validation and all that, and we could do a lot of things, but especially at the class level, you know, you want some guarantees in that class it's not going to blow up. All right, so I could through my UI maybe have some, U, some validation code, but I still want on my class a way of checking to see, hey, are they going to try to do something illegal? Let's think of uh, other examples throughout this uh, class. For example, uh, getting back to the trip assignment where you had a, a trip and a car associated with it and so on. Well, you notice if you didn't initialize the car associated with the trip, all right, then if you tried to do a calculation, you probably got some sort of spectacular error saying that, hey, there's a null object pointer. Well, we can put code to make sure, you know, mathematical operation like dividing by zero is a great example. A um, null object reference is another one that we, we would likely want to trap for in many cases. And there's other ones uh, as well. When we get into date, you know, or when you do database interactivity, that's obviously something that's out of your control and it's risky. You know, you could write the perfect program and if the database server is down, it's going to crash. Well, again, 
one of the ways that a program can be better or improved is by improving the, the error catching, the fault tolerance, and so on. So let's look at the very basics of a try catch in Java. I'm going to make a different test uh, file. Double Z equals X divided by Y. Of course, we know that that's not allowed, and that's going to blow up and going to scream bloody murder. This is okay, and now let's compile test errors. All right, compiled clean, right? Because syntactically our statements are correct. Um, however, um, semantically, the meaning of those statements is going to cause us to do a um, um, something bad. Now, of course, we're you know we're never going to write a program to do this. All right. Um, Unless we're teaching a class and we want to show, uh, we're going to trigger some, some, uh, some exceptions. But keep in mind that we may not know where these values are coming from. Y may come from user input, for example. Or Y could come from a database, for example. All right, so um, yeah, we wouldn't do it necessarily like this, but there could be cases where Y gets set in a way that we don't really know about, and therefore we want to be able to, to handle that. So. If we go and run this, this is what we get. Java test errors. Quotient is infinity. I'll be darned. When did they stop throwing exceptions for this? The same thing happened in VB. That ticks me off. All right. We'll have to try something else. Yeah, right. Now, now, now we can. Probably. Probably. I, I know that that's very often the case. Okay, let's make a string s equals hello. And let's make an int i. And we'll say i equals, we'll cast that to an integer. Okay, effectively what I'm doing is I'm trying to convert this string, which contains a word hello, I'm casting it as an integer, and that should blow up. All right. So, let's try that. Inconvertible types. I'm not doing too well today on generating um, exceptions. Let's see. Well, I know I know what we can do. All right. I do I do by the way go for a, a three strikes and you're out policy. If I make a third error, the class immediately comes to a close and we just all go home. All right. 
Yeah, sir, let's try this. Circle C equals new circle. Okay, that would be a good one too. Let's see. Public double get radius. Return. Radius. All right. And then here in our test errors, and let's say C equals null. Ah, there we go, yeah. Leave it, you know, this is the granddaddy of exceptions, the null pointer exception. So if I can't generate these, then I have no business calling myself uh, a programmer. Although if you recall, I, I was not able to generate it before because if you don't trick the compiler, uh, if you don't initialize it at all, it knows that it's going to be null and it, it, it'll, it'll give you a problem. Or it, it knows that there's a potential it could be null. Here I sort of tricked it in. Okay, so what can we do? We can try that code and we can catch exceptions. Okay? So, for example, I could do this. The syntax of the try catch block is like this you have a try, you have a list of statements and you have a catch, and then you have a type of statement or a type of exception that you can go in and uh, display some parameters for it. So, the way my luck is going, I'm going to go and look online real quick here. Okay, so I can do try and have my block of code. Let's try this. All right. So we have our try, and it can be more than one statement. It can be a block of statements. If any exceptions are thrown, 
within that block, we look to see what catches that exception. All right. Now, exceptions are a hierarchy. All right. There's an inherent hierarchy in exceptions. And in this case, I'm catching any exception that I get. And I'm handling it this way. We can actually do better than that. We can catch certain exceptions, all right, and handle them different. So if this problem occurs, we can do this. If that problem occurs, we can do uh, something else. Okay? So, in this case, we're catching the um, we're catching the, um, uh, any exceptions and we're executing that code. All right. Now, let's go and let's try to generate another kind of exception. All right, let's do this. Let's do your Java square root example. Math square root. All right, let's try that. And I'm going to comment out that line so we don't get that. We don't uh, trigger that error. Not a number. Yeah, and yeah, not a number. I've seen that like in in other languages as well. I'm I'm again I'm very surprised that we're not getting uh, exception thrown. I, I do have to say that. Um, what if you try to use that value of J? Yeah, there you go. That's a good. Yeah, there you go. What she said. Let's try this. J equals J times 2. <laughs> Still not a number. Um, all right. Um, Let's see. Oh. So they're like gracefully shutting down the program rather than allowing the programmer to handle it there. Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I, 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 I do find this a little puzzling. Because it's, kind of, it's interesting because a lot of code, I would think you're expecting it to break. 
Right. And what it's not going to. Right. It's going to go ahead and, it's going to go ahead and try that, yeah. Um, so it might it'll probably break in another area, but for... Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I do have to say this surprises me. I, um, you know, I, I don't work with Java every day. And I, I swear I've seen these sorts of exceptions before. Uh, possibly I'm mistaken. I don't know. Um, uh, quite clearly I am mistaken. I'll tell you what. Let's, let's wrap it here. Again, we'll, 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 we'll uh, do my three strikes you're out rule. That'll give me plenty of time to go over with uh, you folks um, your, your assignments and discuss them so that you can get busy on refactoring. I will make a point of researching this and have some better examples next time. I do apologize for the confusion. Um, all right, we'll see you up in lab.